So let's go to the Word of God today. 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 3. <clears throat> Our text is going to be from verse 7, but I'm going to read all the way to uh, verse 18, if you don't mind, right? We're in the house of the Lord. It's good to, it'd be good if we spend some time reading the Word of the Lord in the house of the Lord. Amen. All right? So let's stand for the, and honor the reading of the Word of God, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Well, before we do that, some of you may have been wondering what all of those announcements were for the pastor and the survey and all that stuff. We're in a pastoral transition. Our senior, senior pastor, Evan Rhonda, uh, were promoted to a different position. And by the way, for those of you who think they're moving really far, they only moved to Lacey. <laughs> it's only two hour, two, less than two hours away. But they have a new position there, so the church is in a, a, a pastoral transition. But... We got the people to keep moving, right? Amen. Yeah. In the New Testament, they started a whole bunch of churches without a pastor, and they grew without a pastor. So we, we can keep growing until God brings it through, and he's put lots of pastoral people here to minister among us. Let's read the word of God. The word, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord and the Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the Lord was. The Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You call me. My son Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not, let, did not yet know the word, did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You call me. <coughs> Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli took Samuel, told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and, called, and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I have spoken against his family from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his family for, forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves, made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. And Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli said to him, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it that he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you be it ever so severely if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. I may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You may be seated. Our, verses, our, our scripture text is going to be um, verse 7-8, seven, verse and it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And there's a colon there, and then the rest of it explains what that means by not know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. You see, Samuel was a miracle child. His, his parents were Elkanah and Hannah. And Hannah was barren. She didn't have any children. And 
Elkanah's other wives would make fun of her and she was embarrassed. In those days, not to have children was considered a curse. And she wanted so much to, to be a mother. And she, she prayed and she asked God for a child. Now she was in the temple, she, she went to the temple to make sacrifices and she prayed and she made a, a commitment to God and said, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. Be careful what you promise God. <laughs> but she did it and he gave her a child and the scripture says when he was weaned, that's in chapter two, she took him back to the temple and gave him to the Lord. And Eli became his mentor, like his grandfather. Eli was old at this time and mentored him in the temple. So he grew up in the temple from an early age until adulthood, sort of an apprentice to the priest. Eli was the high priest, and he had two sons who were also serving with him. And his sons became egotistical. They allowed their ego and their power and the, the fact that their father was a high priest to get over them. And instead of doing what God had asked them to do with the sacrifices and the word, they started violating the sacrifices, taking advantage of the people, taking advantage of the church, taking advantage of them. You see, and that's one of the things we got to be careful of. Because if we're not careful to follow the word of the God and to be humble and to let him lead us, we can begin to start doing things in the name of God that have nothing to do with God. You hear what I say? And you can have people, if you read the scripture, who say, this is what the Lord is telling me to tell you to do, and it had nothing to do with the Lord. So Samuel learned what was right, and he learned what not to do. He saw what they were doing, and he did not follow them. If you read the scripture, it says he became the prophet and he grew in favor with God and the people. And in this process, he, he, God called him to be the replacement high priest for Eli. So his sons were taken out of it. So that's where we're starting the passage here in chapter 3. And there's three things that we can learn from, from Samuel and from Eli. First of all, Hearing to recognize. We're, we're not to point one yet. Hearing to recognize. The third one is knowing and experience. The second one is knowing and experiences. And the third thing is action and obedience. So we're going to go through those three things. Hearing to recognize, knowing and experience, and action and obedience. So the first one is hearing. It's one thing to hear and another to recognize. Do you agree with that? We hear lots of things. But we, we, to, in order for something to make sense to us, there's a process that goes on in our brain that you hear it, and then we recognize it, and when we recognize it, we put cognitive thought to it, and it has meaning, and that is why it comes to have meaning to us in the long run. You get that? So think about it. How many of you, when you became parents, you learn to pick out your child's voice no matter where they were, no matter how noisy it was. Anybody? Yeah. So you could be in a room, you could be at Chuck E. Cheese's. I was surprised that Chuck E. Cheese's is still open. I saw one the other day. And that, <laughs> that's another story. But, <laughs> but you could be in Chuck E. Cheese's and you could have all of those kids running around and your kid, your child raise their voice and you're going to pick it out. You hear it, you recognize it, you made a cognitive relationship to it. So therefore, no matter what else is going on around you, you will hear and recognize that voice and it will tell you whether they're laughing or whether they're crying or whether they're screaming. You will hear it. The second one you can look at is a siren, right? We hear a siren from a police or a fire truck. Normally that doesn't mean anything, but we've been taught in society, it's just a noise, but we've been taught in society that that means what? There's an emergency. We need to pull over, someone needs help, right? We hear it, we recognize it, we recognize the tonal quality of it, and, and we do what we're told to do. Have you ever been for a hearing test? How many people have been for a hearing test? Yeah, if you have a commercial driver's license, you would, you would know this as well, because every two years, 
you have to go and get your physical, and one of the physicals is a hearing test. And in the old days, nowadays they change it. I don't know why they change it, but they changed it. So now it's a voice, but <laughs> in my younger days, and some of you already know this, they put you in a sound booth, right? It's like three feet by three feet, and they close the door. I'm looking at some of you guys with CDLs and stuff, how hard CDLs, right? And they close the door, and it's like a cell, and there's one glass looking out, and the person is out there, and they tell you to raise your left hand or your right hand if you hear the sound. And they play all of these sounds and you're supposed to raise your hand or whatever, right? To see if you can hear well. That's hearing to recognize. It's a hearing test. And you have to pass that hearing test in order to continue having your commercial driver's license. You can't have a commercial driver's license if you fail your hearing test. Some of us who've been married for a while, your wife tells you that you have selective hearing. <laughs> 38 years. Right, selective hearing. But I hear everything. <laughs> but there's, again, there's one thing to hear, there's one thing to recognize, and there's one thing to put meaning to it. Does that make sense? So if you're in one part of the house and your spouse is in the other part of the house and they may say something or call you, you may hear their voice. And they say, well, why didn't you answer me? Or why didn't you answer what? But you, you know, you, you heard it, but you didn't cognitively, right? You just heard the voice, but you didn't put the meaning to it because you may not have understood what they have said. It may be too far, right? And one day Tamina was talking to me and I was here and she was walking away and she said something and I said, I don't hear what you said. She says, well, you should have heard me. I said, well, you were going that way and I was here. I heard her voice, but I didn't cognitively recognize what she was trying to say. Does that make sense? So hearing doesn't always mean you understand. Um, one of the things I like to do, and I, I'm going to get off this point here in a minute because we've got two more, but sometimes I like to lie down at night and you can open the bedroom window a little bit in the wee hours of the night and you can hear what we call the ambient noise of your community, right? You know that? Things that you never hear during the daytime. How many people have done that? And you can hear like the air conditioners humming. Well, right now, if you go to your house, you're not going to hear the air conditioner huh, unless you got a really a bad air conditioner, an old air conditioner, or the motor is going out. If the motor is going out, you will hear it. But if it's running well, you're not going to hear it. And I could hear, you know, sometimes the, the planes taking off, even though we don't live that close to the airport, but at 2 o'clock in the morning, you can hear because everything is quiet, just like for Samuel, it was quiet. You could hear it, and sometimes I can hear the rumble of the cars on the freeway, even though we don't live very close to the freeway. And since I like transportation, I can hear a, a, a cargo train going by, and I can hear the engine, and I like to hear the sound of the train in the background way in the distance, not like 50 feet down the road. But I also learn to hear when a train wheel has a flat spot on it. And you can hear it going on, and you can hear that at 2 o'clock in the morning. And you can, if you know what it is, you can recognize it. Now, some of you are saying, well, he's really weird. Why would you want to know a train wheel is flat? Well, I travel the world to ride trains and ride buses and ride airplanes. So <laughs> I learned to pick up on those kinds of things, right? But what I'm trying to tell you is that... You can hear and you can train yourself to hear certain things and sometimes hearing things that other people may not even pick up around you. You got that? In other places we heard about people hearing as well. In other places you heard about Saul, right? Saul was on the Damascus road. He had orders to go and persecute the Christians and the Lord stopped him dead in his tracks and there was a storm and everything and he heard this voice in the storm that nobody else heard. There were lots of people around him but who heard the voice? Only Saul. One person. And he heard the voice and he put recognition to it because he said, who is it, Lord? And then Jesus revealed himself. He says, I am Jesus the Christ the who you are trying to persecute. So he heard it. He put recognition to it. Jesus interpreted it to him, give cognitive thought. And now he can associate that voice for the rest of his ministry and know what God is calling him to do. Moses had a similar experience. Moses had an experience where... He was by the burning bush. He saw the bush and he went to it and the voice spoke to him and told him what to do. 
So here we see that. The other thing I want you to know is that sometimes we can hear a voice and we can make assumptions of what it is if we don't take the time to know what it is. That's what Eli did in chapter 2. When Hannah was praying to God for this child, he thought she was drunk because he saw her praying and he didn't understand what she was doing. She said, no, I'm not drunk. I am praying and asking God to give me a miracle. So what that is for us is that sometimes you've got to pray. If you need a miracle, don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about what they're going to say. Don't worry about what they call you. If you need a miracle, get down on your knees and you don't stop until you get your miracle. You don't stop until you get your miracle. And that's why Hannah did. She says, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying to the Lord for this miracle. And she was so confident, she says, and when he answers it, I will bring the child back and devote him to him. She told that to, ha to, to Eli right there, the day she, minutes after she got through praying. She was so confident that she had hit the throne of grace that she said, when it happens, I will bring him back and you will see. Do you have that kind of confidence that when you pray to God that he will hear you and he will answer your prayer and you can make a promise that says, when it happens, I will be back here and you will see that God has answered my prayer. So the word here for no, this really hit me. He says, if Samuel was living in the temple, if he was with Eli, if he was seeing all the stuff going on, learning all of these things, then how could he have not known the voice of the Lord? Well, what the word here no means, means that he hadn't recognized it. It's not that he hadn't been in the temple. He didn't know what was going on in the church. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't recognize it. He couldn't understand it. So therefore, he could not give meaning to it. Does that make sense? So sometimes, the other lesson here, we can be in the church doing a whole bunch of good stuff, and we can miss the voice of the Lord. Because all the good stuff is getting in the way. God didn't call us to do good stuff. He didn't call us to be the, the pastor's favorite person. He didn't call us to be all these things. All of those things are good. But what he calls us to do is to hear his voice and to do what he asks us to do. And so my, my encouragement to you is don't let all the good things in the church get in the way of God's work. Don't let church work get in the way of God's work. And sometimes you got to make a distinction and you got to say no to some things in the church because God is calling you to something else. And we got to believe that he's leading us in those things. So, so Samuel hear, did hear the voice and he's, called, he's going to Eli. Why? Because Eli is the person who is his mentor, right? Who is, he's looking to help him through his journey. And Eli finally realizes, hey, God's calling this kid. Samuel was about 12 years old at this time right now. He said, God's calling this kid. So I'm, he, I'm not calling him, right? He came to me three times. I'm not calling him. So he said, speak, Lord. Tell him to speak because you're listening. And what does that mean? Sometimes we need people in our lives who can direct us to pay attention to God when we don't understand what's going on around us. Doesn't mean we're doing anything wrong. Doesn't mean we're sinning. Doesn't mean we're evil. Doesn't mean we're wicked. None of those things. We may be on the right path. We just have to have that person who is mentoring and discipling us to help us follow the word of God and to see where he's leading us. You know what I'm saying? That's why discipleship is so important. That's why we who are believers have got to disciple other people because we've got to help them stay on the path and hear what God is asking them to do and direct him. And I thank God that I've had so many people in my life who would speak into my life and tell me to realize, pay attention to what God is telling you. Pay attention to what God is telling you and follow him. And I remember Jerry Kester one day looked at me at District Advisory Board and he said, when are you going to do what God is calling you to do? In the middle of a meeting with 14 people, <laughs> Jerry says, when are you going to do what God is calling you to do? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know what I'm talking about. God's been calling you to preach for 20 years and you keep saying no. Today you've got to make a decision. We need people in our life who are going to be bold enough to look at you in the eye and say, that's what it is. What he didn't know was that God had called me many years. It had been a 20-year stuff, but this one time, the last time it happened, I was at home ironing. I like to iron, by the way. And um, it's my way, of, my way of meditating. And, 
I'm not even halfway through this message. And, <laughs> and, and God said the same thing to me. When are you going to do what I'm calling you to do? And I said, you don't need me. You got my brother who's a district superintendent. You got my other brother who's a pastor. You got my nephew who's a music minister. You don't need me. I got other things to do. I want to become rich. I want to become a millionaire. I want to live on a yacht. And I want to travel around the world. And he kept persisting. You see, God's voice is persistent. He doesn't quit. So if he's talking to you, he's going to come, and he's going to come, and he's going to come, and he's going to come. And I'm going to tell you, shorten the distance because he is not going to give up. He was doing that a lot longer than you. So I told him, if you want me to do this, you have got to reveal it to 10 other people without me saying anything to them. Like Hannah. Guess what? 10 other people came up to me and said, when are you going to do what God is asking you to do? Jerry Kester was one of them, another one of my friends, who was, who was actually in the ICU with this, with this mysterious illness. Up to today, the doctors don't know what was wrong with him. He was in the ICU. His wife called me and she says, Grantly, Alfred's in the ICU. We don't know what's going on. We need you to come to the hospital and we need you to pray with him. He wants to see you. So I go to the hospital. I go up to the ICU. And uh, I've never had a problem getting into hospital praying for people. For some reason, I can walk into any hospital and I can ask to pray for somebody. And all the doctors and nurses always says yes. They've never said no to me praying for somebody in the hospital or in the prison. I walked into any prison and asked to pray for people. The guards are always, oh, come on in. <laughs> you know? And I was in the hospital, and Alfred is there lying on the bed in bad shape. In the Caribbean, we said he's got one foot in the dirty and one foot in the bed. Right? So he's like slipping away. Right? And um, I walked in, and his wife and everybody says hi. And then his wife says, Alfred wants to talk to you. Clear the room. Everybody left the room. And Alfred looks at me, barely breathing, barely able to speak, and says, when are you going to do what God is calling you to do? And I said to Alfred, you're the one in the ICU. You're the, you're the one hooked up to all of these things. Why are you worried about me? He said, I know where I'm going. i doing what God wants you to do. It's your turn to answer the question. And he prayed for me. Two days later, he left the ICU, and they still don't know what's wrong with him. So God calls, and he's persistent. Job 33, 14 says, um, Job 33, 14 says, For God speaks the first time one in one way, a second time in another way, though a person may not perceive it. Though a person may not perceive it. The second point is knowing. So the first thing we hear, we hear. The second point is to know. Know. One thing is one thing to observe and another thing to experience. Experience builds knowledge. So once we hear the word of God, we got to recognize it. We got to associate meaning. And once we associate meaning with it, then we begin to experience what God is wanting us to do. So Samuel had not yet heard the word of the Lord, and he couldn't recognize it, but now he's heard the word of the Lord because he said, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth, and now God is telling him, this is what I want you to do. So now he knows what that voice is. And if you read the rest of First and Second Samuel, you'll realize that Samuel never forgot that voice. From that day on, his entire life changed, and he became, from then, a 12-year-old student to be in the prophet and the priest. And he went through a whole bunch of stuff I'm not gonna go through here. But he recognized it and he, then he began to experience what it was to be led by the voice of God. So now Samuel is saying, I not only hear it, I recognize it, I know what it is, now what do you want me to do? So God's voice cannot be ignored. 
What, what is it that he's asking you to do? Are you hearing that voice in your head? Are you hearing that voice in your heart? Sometimes it's not always a voice. It may be an impression or an inclination that says, this is what I want you to do. I want to tell you it's not going to go away. He calls us to a personal experience with him. He calls us to follow him. He calls every one of us. It doesn't make one person better than the other. God desires to have a personal relationship with every one of you, with every one of us. And, he, and if you're a Christian already today, he wants you not just to be sitting there in the by and by talking about when I'm going to get to heaven. He's got work for you to do on this earth right now, today, and it's time that we get about doing it. We don't need other people's approval, although discipleship is good, as I said that, but if God is calling you to do something, he is not going to let you rest until you do it. You may be wondering, why am I so miserable? Why are things not working out the way I think? I try to go this way and it ends up that way. I try to do this thing and it ends up that thing. Sometimes that's because sometimes we make stupid mistakes, but sometimes it's because God's calling us to do something and he's going to mess up all of that until we get it and look in the right direction. He's saying, that's not what I called you to do. My 40-foot yacht with a helicopter pad was not the plan. <laughs> that was not the plan. Although it might not be a bad plan, by the way. You could do a lot of ministry with a 40-foot yacht with a helicopter pad. <laughs> Think about all the remote areas of the world you could go while you sail across the ocean. But that was not the plan. Each person is different, and the results may be different, but I can promise you that what will happen if you hear the voice of the Lord, that it will be transformational, your life will change, your priorities will change, your direction will change, your language will change, everything about you will change, because now you're on the path for what you were created to do. And when you find the path for what you're created to do, there's nothing more enjoyable in life than to be walking in the path that God created for you and following him and doing what he's asked you to do. The third point is, it's one thing to follow another's lead and another to be obedient, right? So this is the third progression. Samuel now hears the voice of the Lord. He hears it. He answers it. God spoke to him and God tell him what to do. So now he's got put into the test. So sometimes we hear the voice, but we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it, right? So when I became a minister, when I decided to accept God's call, I told him, I want to do, I, I, okay, if I got to do this stuff, there was a whole bunch of things. I won't tell you all of them, but one of them was, um, I don't want to do funerals and hospitals. <laughs> right? I don't want to do funerals and hospitals. My first official task as a minister was the funeral of a six-week-old baby. I don't want to do funerals and hospitals. Guess what the first thing you're going to do? The thing you don't want to do, because it ain't about you. I didn't call you to give me a list, I called you to be obedient. And I figured that out. To this day, I don't even know why that mother called me and asked me to do that because she had a pastor, she had a church, and her pastor calls me and says, we want you to come and do this funeral. And I says, why, you're the pastor? And she says, he says, she doesn't want me, she wants you. <laughs> so I did it. And then I got invited to the hospital over and over and over and over. And that's what I tell you. I have had pastors tell me, I go to the hospital, I try to pray for people and they won't let me in. I said, well, I've never had that experience. Every hospital I go in, I'm in. <laughs> you know? Remember, I didn't want to do that. So what's he going to show me? That's the place you're going to go. Over and over and over and over and over. I've got to see so many people lives one to the Lord. Be obedient to the voice of God once you recognize it. It's not what you want to do, but what he wants you to do. So how we see that? We see that with Samuel where God told him what to do right now. He's got to go and speak to who? Eli. And tell him something that is bad. Now Eli had known this was going to happen if you read chapter 2. 
But Eli said to Samuel, tell me everything and don't hold anything back because he was his friend. He was like me, right? But when God calls us to do something, we got to do it all the way. All the way, even if it's tough, even if it's hard. His voice may be calling you today. His voice may be, his voice is not always loud. It's not always soft. It doesn't always come at a convenient type, but it comes catered to you. God's call to you is going to be unique to you, called to you, catered to you, specifically designed for you because he designed you. And he knows what it takes to get your attention. So here he is. He's got to speak it. You see, in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 12, it said Elijah was having a pity party. Elijah had done everything that God asked him to do, and he had, he had gone up against the prophets of Baal, and he had won and destroyed all the prophets of Baal and everything. And because he had done that, Queen Jezebel said, I'm going to cut your head off. And he goes to God and says, I do everything you want me to do. I went out there, I went against the Jezebels and all these kind of people. The worship team can come up if you want at this time. And now, why is it that she's trying to kill me? So he went to a cave to hide. Because sometimes we can have pity parties when God calls us. Doesn't mean it's always going to be up here. Sometimes it's going to be down here. And God's not afraid of our pity parties. So while Elijah was having his pity party, God let him have his pity party for a while. And then he says, okay, now it's time to get up. So he says, go outside the cave and look outside. And he said, go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after there came a gentle whisper. See, God can be in all of those things. He spoke to Moses in the fire, in the, in the, he spoke to Moses through the fire. And then, you know, when, when there's an earthquake and when there's a windstorm, that, that, that represents what is tumultuous. You know, sometimes our life can be so tumultuous, it can be up and down. We don't know which way things are going. We don't know how things are going. And life may be unsettled. And God can speak to us in those times. But sometimes he's telling us, hang in there. Hang in there. I haven't left you. I haven't with you. I, have, I will just demonstrate to you what's going on. Just hang in there. So, so you're going to go through the mountain. You're going to go through the windstorm. You're going to earth, go through the earthquake. Things are going to be unsettled. But hang in there. And then after that, you're going to go through the fire. And sometimes we need the fire in our life. That's when we are scared. That's when we're being tested. That's when we, we say, Lord, I don't know what I'm dealing with. What is all of this thing about? But the scripture tells us that once we have gone through the fire and been purified, we will come out the other side as refined gold. And you can't be refined gold if you haven't been refined in the fire. So sometimes the fire is necessary in order for us to come out on the other side to be what he wants us to be. And then is the whisper. Sometimes he just says, be still and know that I am God. Don't want all the chatter. Don't want all the 15-minute prayers. Don't want all the TV shows. Just sit down, be quiet. Put a blanket over your head. And listen. I will speak to you in that very moment seems most unlikely. God still calls us. He's still calling people today. He's still calling you and I. And he wants to know what are you going to do with the call that I have placed on you, that I am calling you to do. There's some people here today that God is calling for the very first time. And you don't know what that call means. You just have this uncomfortable feeling. You don't know what it is. But I want to tell you that he can call you right now. And the first thing he calls us is to a personal relationship with him. To turn away from our ways and say, Lord, I have sinned. I repent of my sin and I want to come and serve you. That's the first thing he's called upon us is a call of repentance. And then he's calling some people to say, you've been praying and you've been asking God for this. And you've been asking God about that and asking God about that. And he's saying, I'm calling you. Today is your day. This is the moment. This is the time. I will answer you today if you will just let me. 
You see, when God calls us, and we answer, it brings us to what is called a crisis of faith. A crisis of faith is an experience where we say, do I really believe what he's asking me? And am I willing to step out in faith and do what he's asked us to do? So just to round it up here now, you know, there's sometimes there are hindrances in our lives where we hear God's voice. Things that prevent us from hearing God's voice. And let me give you a few of those as you're thinking about the voice that may, you may be experiencing right now. Sometimes there are other people in our lives who may be, who, whose voices may be crowding out the voice of God. And sometimes it may be just our surroundings, all the noise and all the things going on in school and church and games and this thing and the next thing and work. You know, sometimes work can be your biggest distraction. But God it can call you through those things. Sometimes we're so mixed up in rules and doctrine and stuff that we worried about the rules of the church and what the pastor is going to say and sister this thing and brother that thing are going to say. It don't matter what they're going to say. That's just noise. Try to hear the word of God. Sometimes we have fear because we don't know what's going to happen. But here's what I've come to learn. If we knew everything that was going to happen, we would die. Because we couldn't handle it. Most of us would have a stroke or a heart attack. But God allows us to, it to be revealed in time, one step at a time, one step at a time. As we take a walk of faith, one thing is revealed and one thing is revealed and one thing is revealed. And then we get to that point eventually where we look back and we see all the things that God has done. But if we'd known them up front, we would have never taken the first step. The last thing that may distract us is that it's already been spoken. If God's word already says it, you don't have to spend two days in prayer to find out what it says. Spend two times reading the word of God and he'll reveal it to you. We don't have to pray about loving our neighbor as ourselves because he says that is the second greatest commandment. So if you're having a problem loving your neighbor, don't pray about it. Figure out how to solve the problem. It's already been said at least 10 times in here, love your neighbor as yourself. So the action is to figure it out, not to ask God, why should I love my neighbor? It's already been spoken. Then finally, the solution. Learn to recognize. Learn to recognize God's voice. Listen. Get away sometimes and be quiet. Have faith. Be willing to obey. Be willing to obey. See, when I stepped into that room with that mother who had lost her six-week-old baby, I had no clue what to say or what to do. Or what do you say or what to do in a room like that? But my ministry mentor said to me, I called him on the phone. By the way, I was on the car over to the house. I said, hey, <laughs> I've got to go and see this lady. I have no idea what to do. He said, that's good. It's a good start. <laughs> he was my Eli. He said, just go. Just pray in the car. I'll pray with you. Just go and just sit with her and the Lord will show you what to do. Good example, right? He didn't have to give me 10 things to do. And I went. And I sat with her, and the Lord showed me what to do. So God will guide us in those times. But the question is, do we have the faith to step out and to obey? So in Hebrews chapter 33, verse 50, it says, Listen, do not be stiff-hearted. Do not harden your heart as in the day. Listen and obey God as he speaks. So if his voice is speaking to you right now, if you have a nudge, if you have the Holy Spirit is calling you today, if you just can't understand what's going on inside of you right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And he wants you to hear his voice. And right now, right here, at this altar, in your seat, in your house, he can explain to you exactly everything that's going on. And he can give you the comfort, the peace, assurance that you need for whatever you're going through father we thank you for your word we thank you that it is alive and it's powerful we thank you that you're still changing lives and you're still transforming lives and we thank you that you're at work among us in jesus name amen if you want to come and receive god if you want to come and receive jesus as your savior if you want to talk to one of our pastors afterwards uh, I'll ask all of our pastors to stand, Jeff, Denise, Elizabeth, myself, Russell. If you want to come and talk to one of us afterwards, we'd be happy to pray with you and lead you through that prayer. If you need prayer for someone else, then also we're happy to pray with you. Once we get through singing this song, 
We're going to ask all the men to come up. We want to pray over the men. Pastor Ev asked me to make sure we do this today. We want to pray over you. We want to invite you to an event next week. So we're going to sing a verse of a psalm, and then we're going to invite all the men to come forward, and we pray for them.